How many happy cheaters do you know? Who has become even better off after the divorce? At least I do not know any such person. People are ready to destroy everything they have been building for decades for the sake of fleeting pleasure. For what? All the people involved in the breakup of my marriage were punished, and I didn't even get my hands dirty. Karma worked. I had plans. I had dreams. Heck, I even had a confidential savings account for the special dream trip around the world we were planning to take in just a few years. As I observed my wife of 23 years, her face flushed deeply, and she continued to radiate a pink glow while conversing with a couple of colleagues during her small college employer's annual employee gathering in mid-September. I stood about 15 feet away, pretending to engage in conversation with another group of her co-workers. Tracy was chatting with Rafe Searcy, whom I had been introduced to earlier as a new English literature associate professor, and Janet Barnes, who worked in administration like Tracy. Given that it was a Christian college, I doubted one of the others had told an inappropriate joke, leaving only one explanation for Tracy's blush, particularly its persistence. She was very sexually aroused. Now I found myself with a potential answer to a question I hadn't even thought to ask. After being married to someone for 23 years and spending 25 years together, you tend to learn just about everything there is to know about that person, even if you're not actively paying attention. And if you are paying attention, well... As a gambler might put it, I was familiar with all of Tracy's tells, her intimate tells. Just ten minutes ago, I believed I had a flawless marriage with an almost perfect woman. Yet now, I found myself unraveling the mystery behind some of my wife's recent peculiar behavior. Behavior that up until that moment I hadn't even recognized as peculiar. Tracy and I shared something more than love. We were best friends, partners, and parents of our two wonderful children. Unlike many couples, we felt great in each other's company and could spend days together without getting tired. Our conversations ranged from intimate topics to broader discussions of history, which were always accompanied by general laughter. I often joked that the real test of compatibility in a marriage is a long car ride with your partner, and from this point of view, Tracy and I were the perfect couple. Our bedtime relationship, in my opinion, was still satisfying. Although the violent passion of our early days was replaced by a more mature dynamic, it resumed after our youngest daughter left for college a year earlier. Since the house was empty for most of the year, we began to indulge in our desires more often, at least three or four times a week. Despite the fact that we were both 45-year-old gym enthusiasts, we maintained good physical health. Tracy, with her long blonde hair and superb figure, exuded self-confidence. Despite the fact that she may have gained an extra 15 pounds after giving birth, she remained perfectly built. I found myself 20 pounds more muscular than I was when I graduated. Furthermore, I had accumulated 25 years of experience in pleasing my wife with my physical prowess. Two months ago, something changed, and since it seemed mostly positive, I didn't pay much attention to it. Our bed life became two or three times more active than usual, and it was a wake-up call for me. It was no longer making love. It was a purely physical act. It was exciting, but the dynamics of our relationship have changed. I didn't ask myself that question at the time, but looking back, I realized that it was a mistake. Except for the brief moments when Tracy was chatting with Rafe, they were no more than five feet apart during our walks. Now that I understood what was going on, I noticed that Tracy seemed to radiate joy when she was around Rafe, even in my presence. He usually disappeared quickly when I showed up, but as soon as Tracy moved away from me, she found a new partner to communicate with. Throughout the event, I discreetly observed the pair, though it wasn't difficult. Tracy appeared to be oblivious to everyone else whenever Rafe was present. Not once did I witness her glance around as if checking for her husband's whereabouts. She made sure to lightly touch him whenever possible throughout the evening. My emotions were all over the place ranging from nervousness and fear initially to outright rage once I was certain of what I was witnessing. What I saw seemed unmistakably like the demise of my marriage. At around 11, I practically had to pry my wife away from Rafe. She didn't appear pleased when I arrived and informed her it was time to leave. 
Briefly, her eyes flashed with anger before she composed herself, but not before I caught the expression. Once again, the 23 years of marriage weighed heavily on my mind. Typically, our evening discussions during the ride home would flow naturally, but this time I chose to remain silent, anticipating Tracy to initiate the conversation. She appeared lost in thought, gazing out of the passenger window until she realized the uncomfortable silence. Then, she broke the silence with superficial chatter about the poorly dressed college president's wife. My response was tepid. Wow, I'm really tired. I'm going to bed, Tracy announced once we arrived home. Are you coming? I wasn't certain if she was trying to avoid conversation for the rest of the night, or if she wanted me to join her in bed to address any frustrations from the evening's arousal. Nonetheless, I declined, opting to watch television instead. I sensed a hint of disappointment in her expression. The next day, Saturday, gave me the opportunity to spend the whole day outdoors, tending the garden, which gave me enough time for reflection and relaxation. If Tracy suspected that something was wrong in our world, she did a wonderful job of hiding it. During the following week, the atmosphere in the house was somewhat tense. Personally, I tried to stay calm, although I found myself constantly checking Tracy's location using the Find Phone app on my iPhone, about six times a day. Each time, she ended up exactly where she was expected to be. In the evenings, she showed a keen interest in making love. Nothing changed the following Monday, but on Tuesday, the Find a Phone app notified me that Tracy had returned home at lunchtime. Fifteen minutes later, I silently entered my house and confirmed the dissolution of my marriage. I didn't have to climb the stairs to make sure that Tracy's partner was really Rafe. Their actions in the bedroom were loud enough. At one point, Tracy screamed, Oh my God, Rafe! And then, You are the best! The last sentence struck a chord. I tried my best to contain my anger, fighting the urge to rush into the bedroom and confront him. I refrained from going in because I knew that if I started hitting him, I wouldn't be able to stop until I caused serious harm. Neither was worth a prison sentence. I am fully conscious that proclaiming my love for my husband above all else may sound self-serving, but it's genuinely sincere. I've cherished him for 25 years, and I hope to continue loving him for another 25. However, I must confess that I have a secret lover, someone so remarkable that I couldn't let go, though I know ultimately I'll have to in order to preserve my marriage. My incredible husband Mike would be devastated if he discovered my affair. That's why I've been trying my best to keep it hidden. Yet, I'm not naive enough to believe I won't eventually be found out. The longer it persists, the greater the chance of discovery. Mike has been my rock for the past quarter century. We've been married for 23 years and have raised two wonderful children together. He's my best friend, my soulmate, and an amazing lover. We used to share everything and laugh endlessly. Well, until recently. My meeting with Rafe Searcy was completely unintentional. He accidentally walked into the administration building a couple of days before classes started. And, without exaggeration, my life changed dramatically. Rafe, a 30-year-old man, was tall, his short brown hair and delicate gray eyes accentuated his physical form. Despite the fact that he had attractiveness, he did not reach the level of George Clooney. However, when I saw him, I immediately felt attracted to him, feeling a surge of desire, as if he electrified my senses. The rest of the day passed in a blur. Thoughts of Rafe engulfed me. By the time I got home, I was literally drooling with anticipation. Mike didn't have time to realize anything before we were in our cozy bedroom. We made love for a long time, although Mike fell asleep contentedly, unaware that my thoughts were somewhere far away, focused on Rafe. Over the next two weeks, my husband and I had an active bed life. Then an unexpected opportunity arose when my husband had to leave town for the night the following Wednesday. Even though I knew it was morally questionable, I felt a surge of nervousness when I called Rafe on Monday morning and arranged to meet him for lunch on Wednesday afternoon. After checking Rafe's schedule beforehand, I noticed that he didn't have any classes that day, so I took the day off as administrative time. We met in a cozy Italian restaurant, enjoying a pleasant conversation and laughter throughout the lunch. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't resist the urge to touch Rafe's hands, feeling a rush of embarrassment, like on a first date. My cheeks were flushed, 
and I was quickly overcome by desire. It was an indescribable feeling. Although the topic of any kind of intimacy was never openly discussed, there was an unspoken understanding between Rafe and me. His frequent smiles, handshakes, and the occasional grin spoke of a common bond, and I was sure of his mutual feelings. As the gentleman he was, Rafe settled the bill and then calmly asked, Where to? My place. It's just a ten-minute drive from here. You can leave your car and I'll drive, I replied with a confidence in my voice that belied my actual nerves. Knowing Mike wouldn't be home until Thursday evening eased some of my apprehension about the upcoming event, but I still couldn't shake off the nerves. At 45 years old, and after having two kids, I wasn't naive about not having the same youthful physique as the women Rafe might be used to. While I should have felt guilty about what I was about to embark on, it felt like a foregone conclusion in my mind. Despite my deep love for Mike, I was resolute in allowing myself this indulgence with Rafe, without any guilt clouding my enjoyment. I parked my car in the garage and closed the door behind us. The next ten hours were some of the most incredible in my life. It seemed to me that Rafe and I had the same strong connection, and every moment we spent together was absolutely incredible. Rafe has completely exceeded my expectations. He wasn't physically bigger or more gifted than Mike. I've never had such an experience as with him. By the time Rafe took an Uber to get his car, I felt completely exhausted, physically and mentally broken. I was so immersed that I couldn't even remember my own name. It was a feeling of total corruption, and I found myself craving more. You are extraordinary, Tracy. It was undoubtedly the best contact I've ever had, Rafe exclaimed, prolonging our last kiss of the day, and his words confirmed our deep connection. I had a clear idea of Tracy McGowan's intentions when she approached me. Her behavior during our meeting in the administration building two weeks before gave it away. Although she never explicitly stated this, I knew that after lunch, we would do something interesting. Men feel it. Tracy was undoubtedly an attractive woman, with a beautiful face, a great figure, and loose blonde curls. She may have gained a few extra pounds, but that didn't diminish my interest in the slightest. At first I noticed the rings adorning her fingers, but then I realized that marital status does not necessarily indicate inaccessibility. In fact, I began to appreciate the attractiveness of married women. They often have a wealth of experience, and a hint of forbidden fruit usually ignites their passion. We enjoyed a fantastic lunch together, after which she took me to her house, where we spent most of the day having fun in her bed. It turned out that her husband had left for the whole day, which allowed us to extend our meeting beyond a short lunch break. It was undoubtedly the most exciting and best bed experience of my life that I had ever encountered up to this point. Returning to my car in the restaurant parking lot with the help of Uber, I found myself hoping that there will be more such days in the future, perhaps even more. I was stunned by Tracy's capacity for deception. Despite that, she continued her flawless performance as the ideal wife the following week, while I quietly made preparations for the impending divorce. I consulted with a lawyer the following Wednesday morning, who informed me that Tracy would be served with divorce papers the following Wednesday. Although we resided in a no-fault state, I decided to file for divorce on the grounds of adultery, a decision I now realize was petty. I had no inkling of what I might have done to push my wife into the arms of another man. Was it simply because he was about fifteen years younger than me and could satisfy her more frequently? Regardless, this wasn't a one-time, drunken mistake. The Find a Phone app confirmed my suspicions when it showed that Tracy had returned home during lunchtime three more times in the past ten days. I didn't need to go home to understand that Tracy wasn't going there to eat cheese sandwiches. I chuckled quietly at the idea. At some point during that period, I went to our snack cabinet intending to grab a pack of brown sugar cinnamon pop-tarts, only to discover there were none left. I had consumed the second-to-last pack the previous day and remembered there was still one left. I also knew Tracy didn't eat them because she despises pop-tarts. So not only was Rafe having an affair with my wife, but he was also pilfering my snacks. Damn him. On Thursday morning, I woke up in a great mood after an incredible night of intimacy. Despite the guilt, I wanted more. By noon, I decided to call Rafe. 
My husband won't be back until 9 o'clock. If you come to me right after I finish work at 5, we'll have time for one more session, maybe two. I offered cheerfully. Put your car in the garage. I admire women who talk straight about what they want, Rafe replied. I was looking forward to this meeting, and as soon as Rafe drove up to the house, I went out to him. I'm so glad you came to me, Rafe exclaimed. It's like I'm in a fairy tale again. These are indescribable feelings. Rafe left around 7.30. I hurriedly changed the sheets for the second time in two days, making sure there was bath salt in the bottom of the jug. Feeling refreshed, I rushed into the shower. An hour and a half later, Mike returned home. My short meeting ended, and I hugged my husband warmly. I treasured him very much. Still, I couldn't shake the guilt when Mike impatiently led me into the bedroom to show me how much he missed me. It was the first time I had contact with two men in a row. To be honest, I liked it too. That was amazing, Mike, I whispered as we cuddled in bed. I really thought so. Mike was a fantastic partner in his own way. Nevertheless, the bond that I had with Rafe was incomparable. I had no qualms about experiencing something so unusual. For me, the relationship with Rafe existed in a separate area from my life with my husband. My husband gave me love, just like Ray gave me something unusual. We continued to meet at least twice a week. I anticipated that Tracy would receive divorce papers on Wednesday at 10 a.m. It took just two minutes before my phone rang. No, oh, 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 Mike, I don't want a divorce, she cried over the phone when I answered. And I don't want a cheating spouse, but life doesn't always grant our wishes, does it? I retorted. I can explain I made a decision for myself, one that we need to discuss. Tracy sobbed. Since you disregarded our vows in our relationship, I've made a decision for myself, too. So no, we don't need to discuss your decision, I stated, ending the call. I managed to focus on work. However, I knew what awaited me at home, and Tracy didn't disappoint. Don't you think you owed me a conversation before filing for divorce? Tracy yelled when I entered the house. After all, we've been married for 23 years. Why? Those 23 years didn't seem to matter when you repeatedly cheated on me, I shot back. From the look in Tracy's eyes and her smudged makeup, it was evident that she had been crying. I wasn't exactly feeling cheerful myself. I love you, Mike, truly. What I had with Rafe was purely physical. It was... A decision for your own benefit? I interjected. To say Tratsy seemed unsettled would be an understatement. I'm sorry for causing you pain, but I think you're exaggerating. We can discuss this, she said. I fail to see how, Tracy. You've cheated numerous times, probably more than I'm aware of, I stated. I know it seems bad, Mike, but... I understand it was solely for your own benefit, Tracy, I reiterated. Why don't you clarify it for me? I thought my sarcasm was evident, but Tracy seemed encouraged by my response and even smiled at me. I can't explain it, but it's like we have this unique physical connection. He makes my knees weak when he's near me, and it's... The best you've ever had, I finished. I heard it. Her eyes widened significantly, expressing fear for the first time. Did you hear? She asked, her voice tinged with both tears and apprehension. Do you want me to replay it for you? I was in the house last week. You two were so preoccupied with your mistake that you didn't notice me. I can't erase that image from my mind. She had the decency to look down, displaying shame. It was purely physical, Mike. I love you. I can't express how much I love you. Can't we at least consider counseling? I know I've hurt you, but I believe you still love me. She was correct about the last part, and that was the most painful. I still loved her, though not as intensely as I had two weeks prior. Twenty-five years of love doesn't just vanish in an instant. Despite being aware of the risks involved, I was utterly stunned when divorce papers were delivered to me at my workplace one Wednesday afternoon. I had never suspected that Mike was aware of my affair. To my surprise, not only was he aware, but he had evidently caught Rafe and me together in our bed on one occasion and had recorded it. What's more, he overheard me proclaiming to Rafe that he was the best I had ever experienced. Damn. I realized I could never adequately convey to my husband the bond I shared with Rafe, but I had faith that Mike's love for me would prevail in the end. 
Initially, I aimed to persuade Mike to accept my relationship with Rafe on the side, with saving our marriage as a fallback option. I proposed counseling, which he agreed to. Our first session with the counselor didn't go as I had hoped. Despite being a woman, she, like Mike, couldn't grasp why I couldn't simply ignore my feelings for Rafe. I had expected her to be more empathetic, perhaps even take my side. Did your marriage vows hold no significance for you, Mrs. McGowan? She inquired after I had recounted my story. No, they mean everything to me, but this, this, is different, I clarified. It's unlike anything I've ever felt before. You're a woman. You've experienced attraction. Well, it's like that. It only intensified, as if I was under the influence of something, I explained. Her skepticism was evident from her expression, while Mike seemed merely puzzled. The stereotype of men thinking only with their small brains is often cited, but women are equally prone to it, as evidenced by today's divorce rates, the counselor calmly explained to my wife. Although the thunderbolt phenomenon is real, most individuals recognize the choice to resist it. You, however, chose to succumb to your primal instincts. I was taken aback by the insinuation that I lacked self-control. It felt akin to being labeled promiscuous. Then came the question that likely sealed our fate for divorce. If Mike were to forgive you and take you back, do you believe you could resist your physical impulses and remain faithful to your husband? Damn, I had thought the counselor would be supportive. I sat there, paralyzed, unable to even respond. Mike would see through any falsehood better than a lie detector. I love you, Mike. Please, can't we handle this? I don't like him, but I need him. This is the most fulfilling bed experience of my life. Don't make me give up on him. I sobbed uncontrollably after speaking my piece. Glancing swiftly at Mike, I hoped to detect a flicker of wavering resolve. After all, he had confessed his lingering love for me. Instead, I was met with a blank stare. Nothingness. I'm sorry, Tracy. I do love you, but I won't condone your infidelity, and I can't overlook what you've already done. I apologize for not meeting your standards of manhood. You exceed every expectation of manhood, Mike. I love you, I pleaded. I don't love him. I'll let him go if it means salvaging us. Please don't abandon us. I haven't. You abandoned us the moment you slept with that jerk, he retorted. Don't shift the blame. I just never realized how self-centered you are. It's all about you in the end. And you don't love me as deeply as I love you. Two weeks after my last session with a psychologist, I found myself in my bedroom with Rafe. I wasn't sure if Mike was watching me, but by then I didn't care. I noticed Rafe on campus the day before and called him as soon as I got back to my office. He was more than willing to meet for lunch. And yes, meeting him was just incredible. Six months later, the divorce was finalized. During this period, Rafe and I had countless meetings. He was my weakness. Although I loved Mike, my attraction to Rafe consumed me. I couldn't resist him, knowing that it meant losing Mike forever. He didn't love me enough to give me Rafe. I couldn't believe it when Tracy actually attempted to persuade me to allow her to keep her boyfriend while still staying married to me. If you truly love me. What an incredibly delusional person. Forget about her boyfriend. There was absolutely no chance of us remaining married, end of story. I may have been naive in the past, but I wasn't going to be foolish now. I was quite taken aback by the marriage counselor we saw, who didn't share Tracy's illusions. Right from our first session, she practically labeled my wife as promiscuous, and it didn't improve from there. She terminated our sessions after the fourth one, informing my wife that I was unwavering in my stance and that she supported me. Tracy looked like she wanted to disappear when the counselor informed her about ending the sessions. I'm unsure if Tracy approached my daughters to request their intervention, but they both made sincere efforts. You're tearing apart the family, Daddy, my youngest exclaimed when I informed her. No, sweetheart, I'm not tearing apart the family. Your mother did that. I'm simply formalizing it legally, I explained. She scrunched up her face deep in thought. I suppose you're right, Daddy, she eventually conceded. I never intended to sabotage Tracy's marriage, but I saw it more as her husband's problem. Although I knew she was deeply attached to him, that didn't stop us from seeing each other. 
I was only fulfilling the wishes of a beautiful woman and I didn't feel guilty about it. I understand his reluctance to be cuckolded, but ultimately, this is his and Tracy's personal business. My role is not to ask questions, but to grant wishes or be responsible for the consequences. Tracy was estranged from me for two weeks after Mike started the divorce process. When he didn't reconcile with her, we resumed our romance. Surprisingly, the situation even improved, since without Mike, I was getting all of Tracy's attention. I have to admit, Tracy was the most incredible lover I've ever met. Despite Tracy's prowess in bed, I never envisioned a lasting future with her. At 45, she wasn't someone I saw myself marrying, especially since I desired children of my own while she already had grown kids. Moreover, witnessing how she treated the man she claimed to love above all else made me wary of what to expect. I silently pursued finding the right partner, without discussing it with Tracy, who was already dealing with the loss of Mike. Things took a turn when I met Lucy Ralston about a year post-Tracy's divorce. Lucy, 24, with her short brown hair and dancer's physique, immediately clicked with me. Initially, I kept Lucy a secret from Tracy, but eventually came clean after two months. I knew I hurt Tracy, but our connection was primarily physical. Emotionally, we were more like good friends. When Lucy and I decided to commit exclusively, I had to end things with Tracy. But I left my husband for you, Tracy sobbed. No, you didn't leave him for me. You left him for intimacy with me. There has never been a us. It was all about physical satisfaction. It was your decision. However, my choice is to find a life partner and start a family, I explained. I was devastated when Rafe informed me that he had devoted himself exclusively to Lucy and ended our close relationship. But I left my husband for you, I exclaimed when he told me about it. Rafe looked at me sympathetically. No, you didn't do that. You left your husband for intimacy with me, he corrected. I knew he was right, but still. Then came the humiliation when my children found out the truth. Mike didn't sugarcoat it when we broke up, telling the kids that I had cheated on him several times for the best bed experience of your mother's life. None of the children were happy with me, but in the end, they forgave me. However, when I baffled them a year and a half later by Rafe leaving me to start a family with a younger woman, I felt like, pathetic, even in front of himself. I didn't directly ask them not to tell their father about it, but I really hoped they wouldn't. I must confess, I wasn't thrilled about how things unfolded in my life. During Christmas when my children returned home, my eldest daughter nonchalantly inquired about meeting my boyfriend. It was then that I revealed we had parted ways. You traded 25 years of cherishing your father for a few years of enjoyment with a younger man. Oh, pardon me, a few years of the most fulfilling bedroom experience of your life, my daughter lamented. I had little to offer in response. I simply gazed at the floor. Losing Rafe wasn't as devastating as losing Mike. While Rafe was incredible in bed, Mike was my soulmate, my everything. Coming home to an empty apartment after work was emotionally crushing, but at least I had the anticipation of passionate encounters several times a week. When Rafe departed, I felt utterly empty. The experience of loneliness was excruciating, prompting me to consider dating again. I was surprised to find that many interested men were in their 30s, some even in their 20s. Perhaps at 47, I didn't appear too shabby. I enjoyed the company of various men, although none compared to my ex. Perhaps due to my long absence from the dating scene, I noticed a significant shift in men's expectations over the past 25 years, particularly among younger men. It seemed they anticipated intimacy on the first date, and if that didn't occur, there typically wasn't a second date. While I wasn't prudish, I wasn't eager to engage in physical intimacy with everyone I met either. When intimacy took place, it generally met my expectations, and my partners were clearly satisfied. However, most of the meetings were purely physical. Unfortunately, none of my novels lasted long enough to develop deeper emotional connections. I longed for true love. I made careful inquiries, talking to acquaintances, hoping to gather information about Mike. He didn't seem to be in any kind of relationship, which left me with a faint hope that we could reconcile. Despite the slim odds, I couldn't understand why he was stalking other divorced women when we had a full-fledged 23-year marriage. 
I realized that I would need to take the initiative if I wanted that to happen. A few months later, I dialed Mike's number and he picked up. Mike, would you be interested in grabbing coffee with me sometime? I asked. I understand I hurt you, and I apologize for that, but I genuinely miss our conversations and would like to rebuild our friendship, the kind where we sit down together, have coffee, and maybe even share a meal. I miss our chats. Um, yeah, Tracy, I think we could do that, he replied cautiously. I... I miss spending time with you too, and I feel like I'm in a better place now. We arranged to meet for coffee the following Saturday. I must confess, Tracy looked absolutely stunning as she entered the Starbucks where we had arranged to meet. It had been two years since I last saw her, but time seemed to have no effect on her. There was no sign of aging, and she appeared to be the same weight as before. Her hair was now shoulder length, and the snug sweater she wore accentuated her ample bosom. She wore minimal makeup, emphasizing her natural beauty. As I rose to greet her, I hesitated, unsure whether to hug her. However, she swiftly resolved the dilemma by stepping into my space, planting a soft kiss on my cheek and embracing me to which I reciprocated. Why hasn't someone swept you off your feet yet? I asked, genuinely curious. She blushed charmingly. Apparently, not everyone shares your impeccable taste, she replied with a smile. I glanced down, collecting my thoughts. We ordered coffee and each selected a pastry. We delved into various topics, reminiscent of our conversations during our marriage. The dialogue flowed so smoothly that we each opted for a second cup of the overly strong Starbucks brew. Thanks for this, Tracy, I remarked as we prepared to leave. How about we make it a lunch date next time? My suggestion seemed to catch her off guard, as her eyes widened in surprise. Sure, that sounds great, she replied softly. Just give me your phone and I'll input my new number. Two weeks later, I rang her up and arranged a lunch outing. It felt strange to think of it as a date. It had been more than 25 years since I had been on one, especially since my divorce from Tracy. Despite my efforts to appear unaffected by what Tracy had done, the truth was her actions had deeply wounded me, leading me to avoid romantic entanglements altogether. Tracy and I had a delightful lunch at our beloved Italian restaurant one Saturday afternoon. Although I sensed she was anticipating an invitation to my apartment afterward, it was a bit too much to expect. Instead, I escorted her to her car in the parking lot, exchanged a friendly kiss on the cheek, and headed to my own car. Over the following year, we continued to meet for lunches. I preferred to stick to lunch outings as it allowed me better control. In my perspective, dinner might lead to post-dinner activities which I was not inclined to entertain in any way. Over the years, it seems like Mike has become more astute. Although we enjoyed our time together, he never took the initiative to invite me out to dinner. I anticipated that eventually he might, and from there, it wouldn't be much of a leap for us to spend the night together. Aware that he wasn't seeing anyone else, I thought that if I could impress him once, I might stand a chance of rekindling our relationship. Unfortunately, he never gave me that opportunity. Taking the hint, I resumed dating other people. I suppose I'll just have to come to terms with the likelihood that I'll merely be another fleeting romance in the dating scene. Tracy messed with my mind so much that I avoided dating women for five years. Even though I didn't see my lunches with Tracy as dates, she clearly did. In my favorite liquor store, as I browsed the tequila selection, I sensed someone nearby. It turned out to be a woman doing the same. She seemed pleasant so I thought I'd share my knowledge of spirits with her, just trying to be friendly. Are you planning to savor the tequila or drown it? I asked with a smile. I'd never drown good tequila. I take it straight like my coffee. No mixers, she replied. Margaritas are for parties, but when I'm serious, it's straight up. Impressive. I didn't know any women who drank tequila straight. I turned to face her for the first time and was surprised. She looked good and didn't wear a ring on her left hand. I guessed she was a bit younger than me, with curly dark auburn hair and sparkling blue eyes. Probably Irish, like me. I didn't realize I was staring until she spoke again. Subtle. Very subtle. She teased when I snapped back to reality. I'm sure I blushed. I apologize. I got caught up in the moment. I admitted softly. 
a variety of tequila brands and a captivating woman who knows how to enjoy them. That's a rare occurrence in my world. She responded with a wry smile. I thought she was about to leave, but then she spoke again. And what world might that be, Mr. Tequila Connoisseur? She inquired. Lucerville, USA, ma'am, I muttered. Ma'am, did you just call me ma'am? She questioned, incredulous. Seriously? Do I resemble your mother or something? Apologies for that. It's a habit. You can blame it on my upbringing. But no, you don't resemble my mother. I adored my mother, but even on her best day, she didn't hold a candle to you. I couldn't believe those words had escaped my lips. I winced. Her initial surprise gradually shifted into a sly smile. By then, I had taken notice of her well-maintained, shapely figure for someone her age. So, why Lazerville, Mr. Tequila Connoisseur? If I may ask politely, you don't strike me as someone who'd struggle to find a date or two. I haven't been on a date in five years, since my cheating ex-wife and I split, I muttered. Ooh, I'm sorry to hear that, she responded, appearing uneasy. An awkward silence lingered for several moments. I lacked the finesse to break it, but fortunately she did. So, what's your recommendation, she inquired, steering the conversation back to Tequila. I'm partial to Don Julio Blanco, and I've been enjoying the new Guy Fieri Sammy Hagar Santo Tequila, I replied. But for a truly special occasion, you can't go wrong with Don Julio 1942. It's pricey, but top-notch. What do you consider pricey, she asked. About $185 a bottle, I replied. But it's worth every penny. She signaled agreement with a nod, seemingly concluding our conversation. Or so I thought. I reached for a bottle of Santo from the shelf, then decided to take a chance. Extending my hand, I introduced myself. Mike McGowan. How about some tequila tasting next door, my treat? It might help you make a better decision, I suggested, offering her a sincere smile. She responded with that familiar crooked grin, giving me an unabashed once-over before accepting my invitation. Together, we made our way to the neighboring bar, spending the following two hours sampling various tequilas. I made sure to order some snacks to accompany our drinks, mindful of avoiding any issues with driving under the influence. As we left the bar, I had Rose Smart's phone number in hand. The following week was a whirlwind of conflicting emotions. On one hand, I was thrilled to have the number of such a beautiful woman, but on the other, it meant I had to call her for a date. The last time I'd been on a date was seemingly eons ago. Panic set in. Maybe I could take her to dinner, or perhaps find a roller skating rink, or a bowling alley. The thought made me queasy. Despite having a stable job and a decent income, and generally being well-liked, I found myself sweating profusely at the prospect of a date. I prided myself on being knowledgeable about current events, although I made a mental note to steer clear of discussing politics. Yet, despite all this, I couldn't shake off the nerves. I realized that one thing remained constant. In the realm of dating, women hold all the card, and they're fully aware of it. However, she had given me her number without any coercion on my part. That had to work in my favor, right? The internal debate continued for days, possibly longer, until fate intervened. Fate taking the form of Anna Ciortino, whom I literally collided with in the hallway of my workplace. As I was still grappling with what to do about Rose, I accidentally bumped into Anna. She stumbled in her three-inch heels and I quickly reached out to steady her, offering my apologies. I may not be very imposing, but I doubt you would have missed me if I had bells and whistles on, Anna remarked after I helped her regain her balance. Something wrong? Anna and my younger daughter seemed to be around the same age. Occasionally we would converse, often with me offering paternal guidance on various matters. She served as my personal informant on matters concerning the younger generation. When I found myself in need of insight into something generational and preferred not to bother my own children, I sought out Anna. She would patiently explain things to me in person, using language that resonated with my 50-year-old mind. Uh, yeah, actually, I muttered, likely coming across as somewhat inept. Anna studied my expression as though trying to decipher a code. 
Then she broke into her characteristic silly grin, leaving me puzzled as usual. Is this issue related to a girl, or rather a woman? She asked in a playful tone. Sort of. Yeah, I suppose. Yes. I continued to mumble. She regarded me for a moment, then seemed to reach a decision of some sort. All right, save the details for Murphy's afterwork, but no teasing when I order my fancy drink or you're on your own, she warned. Later that day at Murphy's, Anna sat across from me, a mischievous grin on her face as I stumbled over my words while talking about Rose. So, you mean to tell me you haven't dated anyone since your divorce five years ago? Not a single person? Geez, I always knew you were a bit boring, but I didn't realize you'd hit rock bottom, she teased. I winced at her mockery, though I knew she was speaking from a place of concern. So when exactly did she give you her number? Are we still in the same month, year? Anna asked. It was five days ago, Missy, and if you keep up with the sass, I might just have to give you a good talking to, I joked, only half seriously. Ooh, sounds like we both might enjoy that she quipped. One of us blushed, and it wasn't her. Seriously, Mike, what's holding you back? You're not exactly a lost cause. You've got plenty going for you. Just give her a call, Anna urged. Anna spent the next 30 minutes sharing with me some of the activities she and her friends engage in during dates. I resisted the temptation to grab a notepad and jot down notes. Can you dance? She inquired at one point. Does the Pope have three left feet? I retorted. Ah, so, that's a no then. You know, women really appreciate it when a man takes them dancing. It's quite physical and gets the energy flowing, she remarked with a wide grin. Really? I always thought that was more of an urban myth, I remarked. No, it's true, completely. It's like a form of foreplay, she affirmed. La, 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 I teased as I covered my ears. She shot me a look before grinning again. Oh, and don't forget to bring a condom. It's always good to be prepared, she advised, looking me squarely in the eyes. Got it, Mom, I quipped. Later that night, I called Rose and arranged a date for the following Saturday. Anna cautioned me not to dwell too much on my past marriage during conversations with Rose, but to answer any questions she might have truthfully. Discussing what happened with someone I barely knew made me uneasy. But Rose was remarkably understanding. She then shared her own story of a 15-year marriage that ended when she caught her husband in bed with their neighbor. The physical discomfort from the syphilis I contracted was far overshadowed by the embarrassment I experienced at the doctor's office. Let me clarify, the doctor and the two nurses were entirely professional, but their disdain for having to deal with me was palpable. The situation didn't improve when I provided a list of six recent sexual partners for them to notify. Damn, six notifications, I overheard one nurse whisper to the other as she glanced over my form. It's probably a good thing she's not 25. I might have exploded if she had said that directly to me, but I begrudgingly acknowledged to myself how damning the comment sounded. I haven't really thought about it deeply, but I guess I've taken full advantage of being singly the last few years. When Rafi broke up with me after Mike's divorce, I admit I went a little crazy. Maybe I was looking for someone who could fill the void that had formed between Mike and Rafi, but if that was my intention, then I was very wrong. How can we replace the 23 years of our life together with Mike or the chemistry that Rafe and I had? Perhaps I was trying to compensate for the quality with quantity. I never really thought about the number of partners I was with until I came face to face with it. Undoubtedly, engaging in unprotected intimacy with most of my partners was stupid and irresponsible. It's not like I was recklessly promiscuous. I was always sober enough to be aware of my actions, and I always chose partners who looked clean and well-groomed. I guess, as they say, when you sleep with someone, you sleep with everyone they've been with recently. I just couldn't stop thinking. What an idiot. At least I didn't have to reveal my predicament to anyone else. Rose and I tied the knot roughly a year following our initial date. Despite lingering trust issues, we tackled them head-on with love and the guidance of an exceptional therapist. I tenderly nudged Rose away as we lay on our sides, facing each other, both of us catching our breath from our exertions. After 25 years of marriage and both of us being 75, making love once a week sufficed. 
We would then spend an additional 10 minutes kissing and cuddling before drifting off to sleep. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Rose was my salvation. Following my divorce from Tracy, I felt adrift. Honestly, I didn't even know how to navigate the dating scene. She allowed me to explore, both figuratively and literally, and we grew together in the process. Although I wouldn't have bet on it, I discovered a soulmate with whom to spend my golden years. I should also mention that karma worked, although I absolutely don't care about it. I found out that Rafe divorced his wife whom he caught with a lover in his bedroom. It's terrible and I understand how he feels, but as I said earlier, I don't care. Let it be a lesson for him. After my, uh, setback, I became more cautious in selecting my partners upon re-entering the dating scene. Part of it may have been due to menopause, while another part stemmed from realizing that despite still maintaining a decent appearance in my 50s, I was no longer garnering attention from those in their 20s and 30s. Moreover, with a surplus of single women compared to men in their 40s and 50s, competition in those age brackets was fierce. If someone had asked me a few years ago, I would have confidently stated that I was destined to grow old with my beloved husband, Mike. However, due to my own foolishness, that plan fell apart. I greatly overestimated my influence with Mike, mistakenly interpreting his kindness as a sign of weakness. I naively believed that his love for me would at least lead to forgiveness for my mistake. A few years back, I relocated to a senior community as my previous home felt too large for just myself. I see my children and grandchildren every few months, although it took several years for our relationship to somewhat normalize following the upheaval. The friendship between Mike and me remains intact, even though we ceased our lunches once I realized they wouldn't bring me any closer to him. It took a while, but Mike eventually began dating again after spending years in isolation. I find myself envious of the way he gazes at Rose. During family gatherings on holidays, I can't help but observe their affectionate glances and endearing interactions. It nauseates me. It ought to be me. I often ponder whether it was worth it, but I'm never satisfied with the answer.